Hello, thank you for coming on this horrible night and with so much competition out there. Um, I uh, won't be reading out of this beautiful publication because I just saw it for the first time today and, and I'm not used to the type. I'm going to read off this friendly printout. Um, okay. Um, this is not a condemnation, but neither is it a love letter. Um, okay. Dear Egon Schiele, I was first exposed to your work when I was a young club goer and student of graphic design at St. Martin's School of Art, hanging out with fashion students, that is, before I had committed my life to fine art, when such creative hierarchies still mattered to me. Everyone in design felt awed by everyone in fine art, and everyone in fine art was secretly threatened by how smart and creative everyone was in design. I remember feeling confused and suspicious about how cool and suspicious your drawings were. Surely art was not meant to be so easy to get, so seductive and entertaining. Your work reeked of fin de siècle decadence, of narcissism, persecution mania, megalomania, and exhibitionism, epitomizing a sick glamour that fashion students and club goers sought to emulate with the aid of eating disorders, makeup, and drugs. David Bowie referenced your self-portraits on an album cover, and we all took note. It was the end of the skinny 70s, another decade that had reeked decadence. And now we were about to enter the suburban kinkiness and self-interest of the conservative 80s, when the word designer would take on colossal weight, and the word Vienna become lodged in the collective imagination as the title of a tiresome overlong hit by Ultravox. Oh, Vienna. At the turn of the last century, and you, Egon, drawing nakeds, not nudes, graphic indeed. You, the master of the flayed yet engorged of stylish emaciation, enigmatic fingers, backbones, and Disney eyes before they were invented. Your very name resonates with your ambitions, as in Egon Sheila to pull her knickers down, except you pronounce it Egon, damn, plus women didn't wear knickers then. Pudenda is an annoying word that I first heard at art school while being lectured to by an art historian. She was posh and passionate about putty and Baroque excesses, and I wanted to be too, being a first year, and so willing to learn. But each time the repellent word intruded into her slideshow and titillated with its saucy technicality, I felt irritated and somehow sexually abused. Pudenda, gerundif of the Latin pudere, to make or be ashamed. No, I protest. Call them what they are, private parts. <laughs> Naturally, looking at your drawings, Egon, it seems absurd to employ the word pudenda, focusing as you do simply on pussy and dick, her pussy, your dick. And also, nobody looks particularly ashamed of their pudenda. However, it's difficult to tell what the women are feeling from their facial expressions, or lack thereof. But you make up for this vacancy by deploying the whole gamut of grimaces in your many self-portraits, in which you're usually butt naked, squirming around like an anorexic penitent in your birthday suit, <laughs> tiny dick glowing like an ember at the root of your contortions. Whereas the girls are, technically, are generally what is technically called semi-naked. There are two memorable self-portraits where you get to relax with a giant hard-on, one as substantial as a tree limb being supported awkwardly by a naked lady, um, another, the other like a baseball bat with you pointing to it, to the tip, like it needs pointing out. One wouldn't want you coming at one's pudenda with that thing, but thankfully that part, at least, was all in your mind. Maybe it was fun to hang out with other so-called delinquent young folk and you, Heshila, and risk a beating for it. Whether it was in Bohemian in location only, the town of Krumau, or small town Neulenbach. Wherever you set up, the pubescent girls showed up, or so it's told. And so I guess it was kind of consensual, nothing dodgy going on, right? It started as soon as you left the academy as Paris von Goethesloh your contemporary observed in 1909 in your, of your flat in Vienna, quote, they slept, recovered from beatings administered by parents, lazily lounged about, something they were not allowed to do at home, combed their hair, pulled their dresses up, down, did or undid their shoes. Like animals in a cage which suits them, they were left to their own devices, or at, rate they, or at any rate they believed themselves to be. It must have been a steady income, supplying the many interested Viennese collectors with porn, you, the predatory porn master, would persuade underage working class girls, urchins, to expose their pudenda for a small fee. 
whereas I guess Gertie, your long-suffering younger sister, always did it for nothing. Egon, your preferred POV was from up a ladder, looking down on the girl or girls in question, because some might be caught, quote, in a lesbian embrace, certain captions confidently inform us, even though the girls were probably pretending to be deviants just for you and the collectors you supplied with erotic drawings. Interestingly, World War I had not yet happened when you were doing some of your best work, so although you might depict stumps in place of limbs, the violence described was a self-immolating, haptic, sexual desire, not trauma. Stumps are enough, because it's not about loss with you, it's about too much. I frequently render limbless figures myself in my capacity as an artist, imagine that. For no other, re no other reason that, some that sometimes, yes, digits are just not necessary. Stretchy leg wank, as a male friend once called it, is that particular grabbed orgasm, that particular grabbed orgasm. You look like you did one 50 times a day. You look sore from it. Skin burdened with sensation, bones for stretching skin, but tumescent isn't a word that comes to mind when looking at your work, because there simply isn't enough actual flesh on you or anyone else. Raw need is what we see, yours creatively and sexually, and the models, we'd have to ask them individually, as individuals, what their individual motives and expectations were when posing for you. But what remains of those transactions are your drawings and watercolors, which are undeniably a turn on. That cranky, creepy, confident draftsmanship, limbing that literally embodies the word arousal, is clearly coming from tapping into the creative vein. You know it when you've hit it, when all the dots start to connect in a delicious, lucid, warm inevitability. Not so easy to represent for women, let alone in a caricatured version as you did, with your dick looking like a fifth limb. Hands, thoughts, eyes, mouths, memories, all locate and create desire anyway, and we've all got those. The rest is so-called coitus, for which there are a variety of tried and tested configurations. Is your work sexually liberating, as some folk propose, or are you a sexist pig? Am I, pr am I a prig? Maybe I'm frigid. That would have been the diagnosis back in the sexually liberated 1970s, if, say, you didn't give a blowjob at the very least to some ugly bloke if he bought you so much as half a lager. Plus, we teens had the pill by then, so what were we worrying about? The sexual revolution was not a level playing field, it was a minefield. But nevertheless, I found myself glad to be gay by the end of it, which was a definite plus. Other folk, probably the sexually liberated again, suggest that your work is indeed very woman-friendly and that it represents our desiring, not just our desirability. The models might sport submissive doll-like expressions, but their plumped pudenda, hot spots, hot spots that glow like Christmas tree lights, warning lights, or both, appear to burn with sensations all their own. Thus, for this empathetic stretch, we must congratulate you, even if you didn't intend it, which you most probably didn't, which is all just fine, because we really can speak for ourselves on that particular subject and have a tru truly appreciated every opportunity to do so. Back to the consensual issue and peer pressure and you being the peer at these teen sleepovers at your place. You had a huge sense of boundary-busting entitlement, Mr. Taboo No More. However, you and your 17-year-old girlfriend, Valin Noisel, were sent packing from Kramau by outraged locals. In Neulenbach, you were finally busted for exhibiting dirty drawings where minors could see them or something along those lines and escaped lightly with a short prison sentence and a drawing being ceremoniously burned over a candle. Wheel on your contemporary Freud to unpack that image for us. The charges of abduction and seduction of a minor were dropped because the 13-year-old had fumbled her story. Traumatized by the whole ghastly experience, you made a group of post-traumatic stress disorder drawings with titles like, Hindering the Artist is a Crime, It is Murdering Life in the Bud. I do not feel punished, but cleansed. 1912. Well, look, Sheila, let's just brush it under the rug in the name of great art. Your work spawned a look copied in, a f copied in fashion magazines, magazine fashion illustrations, magazine shoots, teenage bedrooms, only decades later, starting in the predatory 1970s, when your work was reassessed, when style and depravity was back in vogue. So no merchandising royalties for you. 
No decades either, because you died in the pandemic in 1918, like the one we now all await, the pandemic to finally rid us of ourselves. Fin de siècle Vienna was an anti-Semitic and misogynist town, no? The Austro-Hungarian Empire was in decline, doom loomed, and this was clearly the fault of Jews and women. A bestseller of the day was Sex and Character, a Fundamental Investigation, published in 1903 by the misogynist, racist, anti-Semitic Protestant convert Otto Weininger. He proposed that spiritual progress for the human race was possible if women were utterly, was only possible if women were utterly excluded from the cultural sphere. And had, he had scientific research to prove it. He then committed suicide, thus, causing a, thus becoming a cause celebre, his idiotic ponderings, supported by heavy-hitting intellectuals such as Wittgenstein, Schoenberg, and Strindberg. Did you read it too, I wonder? Did you discuss it with Wally, Wally or Edith, the, the woman problem, as it was called? Weininger argued that fem the female life is consumed, is consumed by sexual function, by coitus, the act as a prostitute, or the product as a mother. The male aspect, however, is active, productive, conscious, logical, moral, while the female aspect is passive, unproductive, unconscious, amoral, and alogical. By way of further explanation, for anyone who's still listening, Human plasma, he tells us, is made up of male, M, and female, soulless particles, W. And everyone has a mix of the two. But some people, notably emancipated successful women type women, have a major imbalance of M and use an imbalance of W. Nevertheless, there were many women who made it as successful artists in Vienna, became household names, more famous than you were, Egon. But you know this already because you were there. What you don't know, because you, you were dead already, is that they all got consigned to subsequent oblivion by male-biased scholarship, and if Jewish, thoroughly erased by the Nazis from the record of Austrian cultural history. By, fin de, by, fin de siècle, by the fin de siècle in Paris, epicenter of modernist investigations, women were finally allowed to study the nude models, cornerstone of classical art training and for the making of important works like so-called history painting. Thus, they could finally participate in the argument, and thus the history of art. To earn a living as a woman artist prior to this, it was genre painting, still life or landscape, like it or lump it, and socially, like everywhere, it was a choice between marriage and career, such as that was. The anomalous Rosa Bonheur had risen, ridden to, risen to international stardom some 50 years earlier. You must have known her work, because she was huge, by bucking these restrictions and painting swashbuckling animal paintings, as she couldn't paint, paint nude persons. This after she had sought the permission from the police to cross-dress as, in order, in order, as a man in order to mingle freely in those places as such an artist where she, she needed to go. If not the life room for humans, then the slaughterhouse for animal anatomy and the street unchaperoned for life in general. Seems like she liked wearing, seems she liked wearing trousers so much, she carried on doing it even when it wasn't necessary. But to be an artist, you do need a sense of complete sovereignty and independence, and the bifurcated garment, trousers, must surely have helped. Plus she was a dyke, which is what Otto blamed for her artistic ability. With his twisted reasoning, it was her excess of male plasma. Anyway, roll on a hundred years, and I can be found in the company of my student comrades, astride a drawing horse, as such easels are termed, in the life room, staring at an elderly, interestingly contoured female model in a stiflingly hot room in Central St. Martin's School of Art, Fine Art Department, now following my calling to change the world via my artistic skills and personal insight, I lean in, squinting as I struggle to arrange her limbs convincingly in the acreage of white paper. Meanwhile, the smart ass next to me, in a first year student conceptual coup, deliberately erases his efforts to form a sabotaging gray cloud of negation, then sits back smiling. Okay, keep on trucking, Egon. Nice shoes, Nicola. <laughs> um, can I just invite Gemma and David to? Come up and 
say a few words about the show? <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, it's very hard to follow that. Uh, I still want to know what a stretchy leg wank is, actually. Um, but, um, but yes, they've asked us to say a few words about how the show to came together. And it, it is bracketed um, fore and aft by, by Egon Sheila. And in, in, in what we tried to do, I guess, was put together a show that we, we felt that if we were curating a show today, which we were, of course, and uh, Egon Sheila was alive, it was a show that maybe we could call him up and, and put him in. Um, there were many things we, we... The show is called The Nakeds, and really that's what the show is about. It's not called The Nuddies, it's not called The Nudes. It's called The Nakeds, and I suppose... In my, in my case, I wanted it to feel like uh, um, a naked m motorcycle gang had, had ridden into Bermondsey, and, um, and this is what we saw. Um, I was, we were looking at Sheila's drawings and, and, and thinking, what, what was it about them that is interesting? What was it about them? That, and, and for me, it was, it was really the idea of, of the naked figure in the void as, as such. Um, it's, that, it's that incredible placement of the, of the figure on the page and the void, and what, and what was that void? Was it a, a sexual void? Was it, a, was it a, the, the aloneness in the universe? And, and, um, and so we, we were looking really for, for artists who had represented the, the naked figure, I suppose, in, in, in that context. These weren't narratives, these weren't stories, these weren't... These weren't um, naked people, uh, uh, you know, slumbering in, 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 on, on fine, you know, exotic, um, you know, uh, textiles. Uh, these, these, these were very much figures on their own in, in, in this uh, universe. Um, so, Gemma. Mm. You, you didn't say. No. You didn't say that this. I haven't said much. <laughs> yes, yeah. You didn't say that this exhibition started um, through a, a sort of debate we had, a row we had really, about the importance of Sheila's work on paper. And David and I conceived really of this exhibition at another exhibition, um, an exhibition I'd curated at the National Gallery called Facing the Modern which looked at a, a social history of modern Viennese portraiture. And David came along to that exhibition. Um, actually, we were, we were talking in advance of the exhibition opening, and David said, what's your loan list like? How many works by Sheila do you have? How many works on paper do you have? I said, well, none. No, no drawings, um, because the National Gallery is too big, the ceilings are too high, um, no one can really appreciate work on paper in a space like that. And David was absolutely outraged by this. Aghast. And said, aghast, <coughs> aghast. And said, you know, Sheila's work on paper, this is what everyone wants to see. This is the work he is, is so well known for. Now, I'm really glad I had that row with David because it was, um, I, I remembered our meeting. It was the first time we'd met. And I also went back to that loan list for the National Gallery and included three works on paper. And that was absolutely the right thing to do. Um, so at the opening of Facing the Modern, um, David and I talked some more about Sheila's work, what was interesting about it. And I've been working on modern Viennese art ever since um, 1995, when I started my PhD at Plymouth University, I'm still, no, PhD at University of Birmingham, um, and I now work as reader of art history at uh, Plymouth University. So I've been working on it for a long time, and one of the um, uh, aspects of my research, um, one of the turns I've taken recently, is to look at Sheila's work on paper, and to look in particular at his really provocative images of naked or partially clothed women. And usually when we think about this work, we think about it what, in the context of um, Sigmund Freud, yeah? The birth of psychoanalysis. We might look at Sheila's work alongside um, Freud's interpretation of dreams, alongside his three essays on the 
um, theory of sexuality. We might consider Sheila in these terms of sex and death, dream and reality. This is what comes to mind when we think of Vienna 1900. And we also might think about Sheila in terms of Gustav Klimt, who is really regarded as Vienna's you know, leading um, draftsman of the erotic and also of the dream. And what I wanted to do in my research was to actually put Sheila in a different context. Because we've all heard of Freud and we've all heard of, of Klimt. But what I don't think everyone here will know is that Vienna at this time was the um, world's largest producer of pornographic photography. It kind of makes sense, doesn't it, when you, when you think about the artwork from that time and place. But you can find um, examples of pornographic photographs produced, disseminated originally in Vienna in private collections as far as Sydney, Australia. So Vienna was the world leading producer and I wanted to think about Sheila's drawings in this context of pornography, um, of innovations with photography, of the pornographic industry. And this is something that isn't usually, usually done. And my aim in doing this was to not criminalize Sheila. Nicola's spoken very eloquently um, about um, Sheila's arrest and imprisonment, um, the seduction of a minor, the dissemination of pornographic or obscene material, etc. And I didn't really want to focus on that. My aim instead with this research was to think about how Sheila was interesting because he tested all of these um, distinctions between naked and nude. Um, he, he tested these borders, um, thinking, well, what, what is decent and what is indecent? What can I put on display and what can I not put on display? What will someone buy and what will someone have to hide? And he was continually trying in his drawing practice to test these borders between what was acceptable and unacceptable. So this research was very much in my mind when I spoke to David about Sheila's work on the opening night of Facing the Modern. And we thought about um, Sheila in relation to contemporary artists, um, particularly artists working from the post-war period, which is when Sheila's work first really hit the international stage up to the present day. And we were thinking about these themes of sex and, sex and death, um, also of exposure um, and um, the explicit of violence and vulnerability. And, and how artists today are still really working with these ideas, with these themes. And this is where the concept for this exhibition came from. Now, as an art historian, I work very differently to David. And so when we decided, okay, we're gonna do this exhibition, I dutifully went back down to Plymouth and got into uh, the library and thought, right, how can I think about Sheila's work in terms of chronology and influence and impact? And I thought, how can I how can I draw a line from Sheila around 1900 through the 20th century? And what would that line look like? And we might stop at the 1950s, 1960s with the Viennese actionists, with Arnold Freiner, with Gunther Bruce, um, and uh, then we might go on forward and we might come to an artist like Tracy Emin, um, who is, I think, probably the most open about her indebtedness to Sheila's work on paper. So I thought I had it you know, in, in the bag, really, and I came back to drawing room to meet with David and to speak to Kate and Mary, the directors, and they said, well, that's not really that interesting, Gemma. <laughs> <laughs> and and, you know, um, and that, that's, that's, that's kind of been done before. We've seen that. Everyone knows that. People can draw that line for themselves. And they really asked me, and, and you know, David really took the lead on this, to think about Sheila in a different way, as far as the context of this show is concerned. And to think about Sheila as the, um, the trigger. And that's a word, a word you used. No, and I never used that. Yes, you did, you did. He always, he always fibs about this. He did use this word. And initially, I was, really, I was really reluctant to use the word trigger, because I don't like its association with, with the gun with the bullet, the smoking gun. But actually, um, a trigger relates to any small device that releases a spring or a catch that then activates a mechanism. And actually, I think that is a very good description of Sheila's role in this exhibition. So we thought about what came to mind when we were looking 
at Sheila's work, these themes of violence, of the void, of exploitation, the explicit, etc. And then in a very sort of free association process, we thought and, and included the artists you see here. We started to gather these artists together. Now, this is a very different way um, of, of working for me as an art historian. There's no interpretation, for example. There are no wall texts. Um, things aren't hung chronologically. Um, and it's been really good for me um, to learn about this more creative um, approach to curating. So I'd like to really thank David and Kate and Mary for um, helping me with that and to help, help me think about curating in a very different way, very different practice. But the other thing the three of them did, which has just been so special, is to introduce me to living artists. <laughs> you know, I mean, it's, art historians say, you know, don't ever work with living artists because they might disappoint you. Um, you can't put words in their, in their mouths. You, you know, they, they, ha they do their own explaining. They don't need you. Um, and, uh, and, and I, I, was, I was anxious about it at first. What would I say? How would these encounters go? But I was introduced to um, Chantal Joffe, um, to Marlena Dumas and Tracy Emin and Fiona Banner, um, uh, also to um, Georgina Starr, and most importantly, I think for me and for my practice as an art historian, to Nicola, to Nicola Tyson. And Nicola and I had a correspondence over the summer vacation as I was working on my essay for the catalogue to talk about the legacy of modernism, the impact of Sheila's work, and how contemporary women artists grapple with it. Um, so that experience of working with the living has been amazing, and I can't thank Drawing Room enough for giving me that opportunity. So thank you ever so much for coming this evening, and I hope you're going to in enjoy the show. Have I left anything out? No, Do you want to I say think you... <laughs> you get I a lecture. I think you pretty up much here. got it. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so welcome to the non-zombie show, The Naked. Um, yeah, it's, it's full of, uh, this show is full of uh, exposure, it's full of the body exposed, it's full of shame, it's full of sexual need, it's full of, full of a grasping for what's important in life, but it's also, in a way, it's very sensual, and it's, I think there's an element of glamour in the show as well, which is, uh, which is what I enjoy about it. But thank you all very much for coming, and I hope you... Uh, Enjoy the show.